On a cold fall day in 1941, Midtown Manhattan was filled with hustlers moving to and fro, making their way in the big city against the backdrop of concrete and skyscrapers. People tended to mind their own business, but kept a wary eye open on the crowded streets as they made their way to the office. A different kind of rat race. The morning newspapers were filled with reports of the Allies fighting overseas in the war, but it was still business as usual in America. Today was like any other day, and a clerk at the desk of the FR Publishing Company was already busy taking calls and fielding messages. He must have been preoccupied because he barely batted an eye when a figure walked up to his counter in a hurry to place an ad in one of the company's most successful magazines. The copy was ready to go and fully typeset, and it included some smaller, attention-grabbing lead-ins for good measure. The clerk quickly accepted a cash payment and moved on as the figure opened the exit door and disappeared into the crowd. This would be the start of the deadly double. Sometime later, the November 22nd issue of The New Yorker arrived on newsstands and in mailboxes across the United States. As readers chuckled at the cartoons and lost themselves in the diverting fiction that would make the magazine famous, many of them took notice of the promotions for a game of chance that were scattered among the pages. Perhaps the most striking image commanded their attention with the German word Achtung, writ in large, bold, gothic script, followed by warning and alert, below which were renderings of dark and light dyes emblazoned with an unusual array of numbers. Another image featured a graphic of a shield-bearing, double-headed eagle that looked ominously similar to a Nazi symbol of the Third Reich. Although the ads were designed to capitalize on the intrigue of the faraway drama going on overseas, they would soon take on a sinister cast. Little more than two weeks had passed when Imperial Japanese fighter planes bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, bringing the seriousness and horror of war to American soil. It wasn't long before people began to wonder if this parlor game was something more, part of a devious plot to warn and activate enemy sympathizers across the nation. In uncertain times, the power of suggestion can take hold of even the most rational minds. Rumors of a conspiracy began to swirl as people took a second look at the copy that now seemed to carry hidden meaning. With its scene of people playing a game of risk during an air raid, gambling as they hid from the specter of death, suddenly the ad they were reading seemed less than innocent. We hope you never have to spend a long winter's night in an air raid shelter, but we were just thinking, it's only common sense to be prepared. If you're not too busy between now and Christmas, why not sit down and plan a list of the things you'll want to have on hand? And though it's no time, really, to be thinking of what's fashionable, we bet that most of your friends will remember to include those intriguing dice and chips that make Chicago's favorite game the deadly double. By this time, intelligence officers were trying to crack the source of this insidious communique. How could this cryptic message have slipped by them? Who was it for? What did it mean? The person who had placed the ad had long since vanished, and there wasn't much to go on, especially since the copy was so vague. Only the dies' faces seemed to give any real hints, as they were inscribed with the numbers 12 and 7, the month and day of the attack. With no real leads, it wasn't long before the story became a wartime legend, passed around as officers caught up on news from the front over a round of drinks. Yet even as the battles dragged on, the mystery never really went away. In 1944, pilot Joseph Bell was flying a Navy transport route over the South Pacific and happened to have an intelligence officer on board. After making an unexpected stop at an airbase, they began trading stories, and the spy told him all about his first-hand experience with the deadly double enigma. In a state of drunken candor, the officer told Bell that many covert officials believed this ad had been a warning about the Pearl Harbor attack. The spy had, in fact, been assigned to the case himself, but the clues went nowhere. As far as he was concerned, the game and its maker, Monarch Publishing Company, had never existed. Bell recounted his tale in the December 7, 1989 edition of the Los Angeles Times. 
1944, I was flying Navy transport planes in the South Pacific. Along with the cargoes we delivered to combat areas, we often carried military passengers. And during the long hours between islands, I would often turn the plane over to the co-pilot and go back into the cabin to talk with passengers. One of them was a young naval intelligence officer on his way to Okinawa. We had some engine trouble on that trip and had to lay over unexpectedly in Guam. The trouble wasn't serious and we were booked out the next morning. So my new intelligence friend and I went to the local officers club to tip a few before we turned in. And there, over the third drink, he told me a story that he probably shouldn't have that stayed with me until I was home after the war. Bell recalled that his new friend seemed eaten up by the case, which had a strangeness he couldn't shake. After the war, when Bell returned to university, he went to the library to look for the ad and found it in a bound edition of The New Yorker. Sure enough, as his eyes scanned the images, he noticed a graphic of two X's inside a shield, the sign of the double cross. The rest of the ads were signed Monarch Publishing Company, New York. Recalling the officer's words, Bell took the story to heart. Years after the war in 1967, the story of the deadly double was still tickling the fancy of military enthusiasts all over the world. Spy fiction was having a moment. The latest installment in the James Bond franchise, You Only Live Twice, was a critical and commercial hit. And John le Carre was releasing one bestseller after another. World War II historical fiction was making its mark. Joseph Heller had published Catch-22 in 61, and even proper historians were making headlines with real-life tales of the front. In a press release for his book The Broken Seal, Operation Magic, and the Secret Road to Pearl Harbor, military intelligence experts Ladislas Farago brought the tale of the deadly double to a new audience and even sparked a mention in the New York Times. On March 12, 1967, the paper noted that the date, time, and location of the Japanese surprise bombing of Pearl Harbor may have been contained in a set of cryptic advertisements published in the New Yorker magazine 16 days before the attack. Farago proposed that the magazine ads may have been intended to notify Japanese agents in the States that it was time to close up shop. Like others, he believed the numbers 7 and 12 could have referenced the date of the attack. Other numbers, 5 and 0, may have alerted foreign agents of the time of the offensive, which actually started around 7 a.m. The Roman numeral double-X combination that appeared on one of the dies could have stood in for the number 20 and has been used to indicate the approximate latitude of the headquarters of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Perhaps, after so much time, it would take a report in the paper of record to unravel the mystery once and for all. Reporters at the Times had decided to follow up on Farago's claims, and the very same week, they published a story contending that the wartime riddle was a hoax all along. In fact, they claimed that anyone who cared to consider the evidence would find a perfectly reasonable explanation for the origin and meaning of the ads. Apparently, when Farago's story came out, a woman who claimed to be the widow of the game's creator, Roger Paul Craig, had contacted the paper in an effort to set the record straight. Mrs. E. Shaw Cole of Montclair, New Jersey, denied that advertisements were covert messages of any sort and contradicted the notion that they had anything to do with the Pearl Harbor attack so many years ago. Mrs. Cole even said that she had helped her husband write the ads and that the backstory about playing the game as bombs exploded above was simply meant to add a touch of excitement and danger to the promotion. Unfortunately, their gambit backfired. Instead of creating a best-selling game, the couple had drawn unwanted attention from the feds, who visited the couple in an attempt to crack the puzzle. Mrs. Cole told the Times that she had never discovered how her husband had selected the numbers that would be placed on each die when he designed his game. She went on to note that the game was never a success despite its notorious reputation. Following a tense interrogation, agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigation concluded that the Craigs were not, in fact, secret agents in cahoots with the enemy. The connection between the ads and the attack was simply an unfortunate coincidence. Could the case really be resolved easily after so many years? Perhaps it was the case that people preferred a wild tale to the truth of the matter all along. Decades earlier, in May 1942, Los Angeles Times columnist Chapin Hall had located Mr. Craig and questioned him about the prescient ads, concluding that they had been picked up and spun into propaganda to stir up patriotic animosity towards enemy forces. 
The story had received plenty of attention in his day, and Craig had his fair share of trouble because of it. Instead of being overrun with orders for his new game, Craig's company was inundated with telegrams, letters, and calls from concerned citizens and would-be investigators who demanded to know why Craig would be tipping off Japanese sympathizers to a surprise attack. Although Craig found the letters far-fetched, he couldn't ignore the fact that they were cutting into his business. Even so, he told Hall that, you should see the complicated evidence that was marshaled to show the numbers on the dice, clearly announce the date of the forthcoming attack, 12, 7, and other acrostic arrangements of the visible numerals, together with incongruous calculations based on the number of advertisements and the page numbers in the magazine, carried an additional coded message to alleged Axis agents that was read into the copy. After all was said and done, Craig felt he had been maligned by a raving, incredulous mob. He could not understand why people would believe that Japanese immigrants and collaborators spread across the United States would read through copies of The New Yorker looking for coded messages from the Empire of the Rising Sun. Yet somehow the message traveled far and wide, and as Craig said, nothing travels as far and fast as a grossly inaccurate and malicious rumor. In the end, the Craigs made out all right. In a strange twist of fate, Roger Paul Craig was pulled away from the realm of invention and into his nation's spy game. According to the Widow Cole, during World War II, Craig was called to serve in the Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor of the Central Intelligence Agency. The story of the deadly double would seem to have a tidy ending, with all loose ends wrapped up. But are we really supposed to believe that everything we know about Roger Paul Craig's game is merely a freak specimen of coincidence? Or were Craig and his widow merely planted to cover up a failed effort to decrypt and uncover an enemy operation? Over 80 years later, it seems we'll never know for sure. Yet there's little doubt that a potent cocktail of fear, imagination, and circumstantial evidence can have a profound effect on otherwise reasonable people. When you add in the uncertainty of a game gone wrong, you too might be willing to gamble that a far-fetched story will always hide the secret key to a mystery worthy of a film noir.